um, where things live in the custom directory, um, the Arbitrex custom directory is something that we didn't used to have way back in the days before light. Um, <laughs> and the addition of the Arbitrex custom directory uh, was actually a real boon to anybody who's doing any kind of configuration or customization because it gives you a place that's kind of built into the software where you can drop your stuff and the software will automatically pick up things that are placed in that custom directory. And you don't necessarily have to have a custom directory built directly in the software tree. You can put it wherever you want, set an environment variable, but the custom directory is very important to any kind of customization or configuration. Question. One of the things you can do is uh, specify the target location for a composed web application. So if you have a WAR file, you can say, you know, I want it here <laughs> with this URL. Um, there's user intuitive web page navigation features that are part of digital media consumer. Uh, there's full support for Arbitrex profile based publishing, um, and that goes as far as um, not only just the permissions that you have in the document um, or the profiles that you have set up in your XML content, but uh, if you want it to, it can go so far as to go into the world of security and actually not show things or show things based on, you know, log on presence in a CMS or um, in an LDAP type of situation. Um, there's some APIs to support search and multiple language switching. I am going to stay away from the APIs in any of the really, really under the, under the hood stuff today, um, just as a matter of time, um, because we want to have a lot to show you. <laughs> and there's a lot more after that. But. So we'll start out under the hood. I, ha I had a quick question, Jean. Sure. Does DMP support the e-reader format, EPUB, for iPad, smartphones, etc.? That is a good question, and my answer at this point is no, it does not support it. Um, I haven't actually talked with development or product management about what the intention is um, for a digital media publisher to support it going forward. Um, if you have an HTML-based, like I know there's a bunch of browser EPUB applications out there, Potentially, you could configure a digital media publisher to actually call the executable for one of those browser-based EPUB implementations, and that would be something to experiment with. But um, it's not completely off the table, but it's not exactly officially on either. Does that answer the question? Yes, it does. Thank you. Oh, okay. So um, I'm going to take you guys through a visual tour, but before I take you through the visual tour, um, I just want to walk through a couple of things, the content types that you can handle. Um, it can publish HTML, PDF, text, XML, Microsoft Office, anything that you can display in a standard web browser. Um, that includes any content requiring third-party plugins. Um, and you'll see a little bit later that, you know, kind of, if you can call the executable for it and the executable can appear in a browser, then you can pretty much do it in digital media publisher. The end end composition is available for all of the document types that have a properly configured Arbortex styler based style sheet. And there are some advanced features that are available uh, via a specific digital media publisher map document type. Um, that's used to assemble and kind of manage the publication. Um, when those things go from multiple volume publishing, uh, doing multiple languages, um, obviously the, the Arbitex favorite eight um, are supported, uh, and I believe that you know, support for different languages can be added as needed. Um, and then there's also this concept of update package creation, where you can create a digital media publisher or digital media consumer image, and then you can publish an update. So you don't have to republish the whole thing, you just publish the update, and your users will have the option of either a manual update where they say, hey, go and update my stuff, or they can have a scheduled update, or it can be pushed to them um, so that they always have the latest and greatest stuff that you want them to have at the time that they need to have it, which is the big important thing here. So. For the output types 
for a digital media publisher. There's an input image, which is a kind of pre-publishing image. It's, it's a way of um, making content that is not necessarily data content ready for actually including in a digital media publisher image. Um, there's a digital media publisher image itself, which is what you would view through the consumer browser. Um, and when you get an image, you can either deploy it on a web, you can deploy it through a WAR file as a web application, you can deploy it as a help system. A very good example of that would be the Arbitext Help Center, which is actually deployed both in the software as a help system and um, on the web as a web application. Um, so there's different options that you have available um, for that end of things. And then further under the hood, just just to show you a little bit more about the update, there's an update that specifies a couple things. Um, it tells you where you want your output, your update package to live, what the previous version, the version of VMP that you're updating, and what the current version that is the, the version in the update. Um, and then you can create the packages, you can deploy the updates, you can deploy them remotely, locally, you can actually deploy mixed remote and local. Um, the limitations are, or actually the opportunities are fairly wide open. So what are these inputs? Um, as I mentioned, the image input is where you assemble uh, your content and XML content using a DMP map and any index terms and profiling and or metadata you want associated with that particular map. Um, then you have the ability to generate just a WAR file, um, a standalone one-shot file that you can post out to a servlet um, server like Tomcat. Uh, the DMP image is really for standalone Im application images, um, again, that you would want to distribute via alternative media, DVD, flash drive, however. Um, the help system uh, is an image that could actually built, be built in to an application's online help. So um, here's a, a little uh, bit of trivia here. Um, Ditto Open Toolkit has this thing called Eclipse Help, which is basically a kind of help system specific for uh, Eclipse, which is an IDE, Integrated um, Development Environment. Uh, the help system feature of Digital Media Publisher uh, is, is similar to what Eclipse Help does in that you can make it the help system of an application or you can deploy it separately from the application as a web app. Um, and then, of course, we have the update packages, which is um, basically a zip archive, a manifest file, and the two of them together can uh, be put out there where people can go and pick them up and update their images. So um, a bit about the DMP map. It's used to publish large document collections. Uh, it's basically a master map. It references other resources, including other data maps, other DMP maps. You could put graphics in there. You could put PDF files in there, um, Word files. How, how, whatever. Um, it does provide features for controlling publishing properties such as volume or language. And there's another feature that can be used, um, which is there's an additional content directory um, that's part of the underlying hierarchy that can be used to make new topics available to users without deploying either a new image or an update. Um, so that is something that's also available as well. Um, and the hierarchy is basically a set of metadata, and then you have sub language sets, and then you have your topic references inside. So you have your project information, your update information, and your volume information. And this is basically the publishing constraints or you know features of, that you want to include in your project. So. Before we go on, give it a new paint job. Let me flip forward a couple of pages in my notes here. While you're flipping, a... I had a question. Sure. Do you need a CMS as a front end to use Digital Media Publisher? No. No, you do not. You can publish um, 
you know, if it if you can get either a URL into a DMP map or a file path, um, you can use those, or you can connect it up to a CMS like Windshell um, and do it that way. A couple more things um, I wanted to mention is that the WAR files that get produced um, are ready to deploy um, any servlet container that supports JSP, Java Server Pages 2.0, and servlet 2.4 specifications. Um, and one thing to know is that um, end users will run the image directly from media, or they can run an installer that will actually install it directly on a desktop um, for a local scene. And then as a help system, um, it's everything that the regular DMP image has, but it doesn't include the Java runtime environment in the package that it puts together, because there is an assumption that you already have a Java runtime environment, either as part of your application or on your desktop. So I'm going to go into our tour here. And basically, this is an under the hood look um, at digital media publishers file hierarchy system. And I actually put this together because it was very helpful to me um, in figuring out what the heck was going on um, and where. Because it's um, all matter of, of what you're willing to go through. So you can see here that we have. Our, our basic digital media publisher in the middle. And the DMP image is basically you have your web application, online help, direct media, updates, image input. And for the image input, as I mentioned, um, it is basically um, the UI is delivered through the Java Servlet 2.4 and Java Server Pages 2.0 specifications. So if you have a servlet container that handles those specifications, you're in luck. Um, we do distribute Tomcat as part of Publishing Engine, and everything, of course, is tested with Tomcat, um, and it seems to work pretty well. So, um, And then the look and feel of the UI that goes into Digital Media Consumer is actually um, something that is controlled primarily in XSLT at style sheets and JSP pages. So, and I just realized I read you notes <laughs> from the wrong place. Um, so, let me put this back in context. Save those last comments for a moment from now when we talk about the client. The image input. Um, the DMP image is the way that you create the multi-document approach to publishing. So anything that you publish as image input, DMP image input, is going to create a published version of a document that can be staged to be used in a bigger digital media publisher environment. Um, and it's all done by references in, in basic digital technology. So going on into the consumer here. Uh, then consumer, there's a couple of things that get included. Um, there's an installation process, um, and these are all configurable things, believe it or not. You can configure the installation process as much as you want. You can put in your own readme, you can put, put on your own, um, you know, license terms, things like that, change graphics. Um, there's publisher templates, which are the actual JSP X pages and the XSL that go with them um, to make up the various parts of the interface from the frames, navigation, um, table of contents, search, uh, as well as the content windows. And of course, there's an embedded browser. The embedded browser has both the Java server pages and the actual published content as well. So, moving over to the other side just in terms of creating the DMP map. When you create a map, um, first of all, you have to have a location to put your map and have it reference the content and make sure that it can get all the content that it needs to get. And then there's this thing called a layout template. The layout template is what we're fairly interested in here because the layout template is <sighs> what's going to let you customize uh, and produce images that are unique to your site, your products, your look and feel. And so first we'll start um, 
every single uh, publication has some kind of properties associated with it. And those properties are going to be things like um, controlling how the image is published. You need to consider a couple things. If you have created a custom template, um, then you need to set the value of the template name to the name of the folder or directory containing that custom template. Um, and that you would do that here in the DMP properties. Um, if you're not creating an update to something that's already installed, you need to make sure that you have project ID and project version values that are different than from earlier projects. Otherwise, you could wind up with a conflict. Um, all of this information is, is fully explained in the Digital Media Publisher Developer Guide um, documentation. Um, so there are things that can be found there. Messages, properties, images, properties. These tell you what the basic images and pro uh, messages that you want to be included. Um, these are all Java properties files. There's a search config XML file that gets generated at the time um, that you create your image. And it basically takes things like your metadata, um, the things that you've indicated as search fields and various other values, and it actually generates that file for you. Um, in so that's one of the things is that when you get to setting up the search, Digital Media Publisher does it for you. You don't have to go behind the scenes and do a lot of search configuration uh, unless that's you know, your thing. Um, then there's this manifest XML. The manifest XML file is only something that's ever put out when you have an update. Um, and it basically explains what the update is. Um, it says what's in the update, where it lives, uh, and it's what your, when you have a client and you say, I want to go update, it goes and talks to the DMP manifest.xml file to figure out what's going on. So, and then you have this installation area of the layout template. And the installation area is where you can do things like you can customize a readme, you can write your own licensing information. Um, you can put scripts in there. You can change languages. Pretty much anything you want. You can add additional, like up here you can put in third party uh, types of applications if you want to include those. Um, and then there's a configuration area. You can change icons. Some of the stuff you will see. Um, keys, we're not really going to go into today. That's uh, about the security and encryption. Um, we do have the resources, and in the resources, hang on, um, there's files that are specific to the look and feel as well as the function of what gets put into the actual digital media consumer browser. So you'll see here that in your app, you're going to have splash and icons, you can configure dialogues, you can um, talk about which things, uh, toolbars are enabled, disabled, um, or are hot areas. Um, images properties, messages properties, as I mentioned, are the things that will control various, uh, you know, uh, hover over messages or various other messages that you might get from the interface. There's a templates area. Um, a templates basically, and we're only going to talk about the frame today, the simple Basically, you know, fair, uh, everything in the, f in the frame except for all the complex stuff is in the simple, except for the frames. So, um, there. That was gracefully said. <laughs> so, in talking about the frames, basically, with the templates, you have these templates, and they define the appearance and the operation, and it's the place... Um, of the directory folder that contains all the .xml, .jspx, and other files like the XSL that DMP uses to, to create the user interface. So there's this area of the template, which is called template.xml. It lives directly in the frame folder, in the default folder. And uh, it basically calls all of the Java server pages um, by file name into the project. And 
there are, is an area for you to say what the project is, um, define the metadata. Uh, there's pages, um, and that's back to the template.xml file on um, Java server pages, um, which are the .jspx files. Um, there's a configuration beans area under the hood, um, and generally we tell people you probably don't want to mess with those. Um, so you can see, like, here we have the various XSL files that are available. Um, so we have XSL for bookmarking errors, index terms, research, or search and table of contents, area searches and update logs. In the CSS, there are two different CSS files that are configurable. One is the actual look and feel of the consumer, and the other one actually controls search highlighting. You can have up to 10 words highlighted um, when you do any one search, and each of those 10 words will appear in a different color. Um, or, or if you want, you can actually turn that off as well. Um, images are sort of GIF files. Um, you can use JPEG files. Um, it's not that hard to go through and find what the file names are in the various eight areas uh, and change those if you need to in the JavaScript pages or in the Java server pages. Um, the JavaScript area see if we can get this to work right. Okay, clearly we're not expanding beyond JavaScript here. Um, my bad. So I'm going to have to show you guys these, these things. The JavaScript um, pages are basically, you're going to have things like form data, frame size, um, highlighting, what happens with index terms, uh, your tab, toolbar, um, the tree, so the table, contents tree, um, update, things like that. Um, and there's also basic utils that gets called into every JavaScript. The locale settings um, are the basic PTC Arbitext 8. Um, so that should be fairly easy. You'll be able to see that there are folders for all of that. And in the XSL itself, um, for some reason, that expanded, but the other ones didn't. Um, we'll have to talk to my manager about this. <laughs> you have the basic um, XSL pages I mentioned earlier. And then finally, you have the Java pa server page templates. And there's um, a, quite a few of those, actually. Um, and I, by no means, am a master of Java server pages, um, but here's the good news. They are written in XML, and they do have a specification that goes with them that says what the tags are, and our text does in have in our own documentation in places where we've extended anything, um, there's a namespace and an explanation in our documentation of what it's supposed to do at that point. So if you can read HTML and you can read XML, you can read through these Java server pages and eventually figure out what it is that they're doing. And then the part that gets controlled by the container is the web inf, um, which basically goes into Tomcat. And in there, you have a couple of different things um, in terms of the indexing. Uh, things that are configurable here is the fields that are searchable, um, and you can pretty much make, you know, if you have an element um, that you can get a handle on, you can make that a searchable field. Uh, and uh, we also have stem files, which are uh, word stemming, um, so configurate, configurable um, types of words that can be made out of each other. And then stop words files, so, you know, don't search on and or or, or not, that type of thing. So that basically takes you through our under the hood. I'm going to go back to our presentation here. And we're talking about giving it a new paint job. And let's see. To give it a new paint job, there, like, as I mentioned, you can customize the installation process, the embedded browser publishing templates, and the browser pages themselves. And what I just talked about in the tour was this DMP layout um, folder 
in the custom folder. If you put your customized layout folder in the DMP layout area of the custom folder, it will automatically be picked up by Publishing Engine as an option for publishing your content. So let's talk about doing that for a moment. I am going to go to my desktop if I can get there. So we talk about paint jobs. So the first thing I'm going to show you here is just the plain old out of the box. This is what you get with Arbortex Digital Media Consumer. And um, what I did in advance of this is uh, I'm doing a little bit of the, the Food Network thing here. Um, I prepared some images in advance so that we wouldn't take time uh, building these images. Now, that's not to say that digital media publisher builds slowly. Um, it, there are uh, specifications for how quickly it does publish um, under a variety of different circumstances, the amount of content you have, the complexity of what you're trying to publish, um, what you're doing with indexing, uh, that type of thing, um, all contribute into how long it takes. But generally speaking, uh, it can do, I think, you know what, I'm not going to say it because if I say it uh, off the top of my head, I'll have gotten it wrong. But, uh, it is in the documentation. So you can see here that we have your basic consumer, and I think most people have probably seen this before. This is what you get out of the box with Arbor Text. So you have some advanced search options where you can just do the entire document or document headers. Um, and you have options here. I'm not running this as a web app, so I can actually change these options. If I were running this as a web application, that is for a URL, as in with online help, um, as the Arbitex Help Center is offered over the web, then I would not be able to actually do things like enable or disable any of this. Um, then beyond that, just the look and feel of the graphics in the table of contents and the look and feel of the various pages that you have here and what your links look like and what your various other things look like. I'm looking for one here that will, there we go show you some graphics. So this is what it looks like out of the box. Giving it a new paint job is not that hard. You can see here that one of the things I did was I customized the splash screen that it opens with. I customized the icon that it opens with, for that matter. Um, so we're going to give this a chance to come up. And you'll see that this looks different. So you can see that one of the things that we've done here is we haven't really changed the content areas so much, but we have changed the look and feel um, in terms of graphics, in terms of uh, the fonts that are being used, in terms of various things that are being included. Um, and one of the things I did here was um, I demonstrated an area where you can actually uh, put a PDF file in and send it all the way through. So if I click on the PDF file, it's actually going to open up this PDF file. We'll give it a minute. So we'll open the PDF file and whatever the default reader on my machine is. Um, this happens to be just a, a free book from O'Reilly. Um, one thing that you do need to know about PDFs is you can't have any security or encryption on the PDFs. Um, they do need to have the security open and the encryption uh, turned off uh, for them to go through. And part of that is so that the publishing application can get at the metadata that's needed for actually searching that. So for instance here, if I wanted to search, I could stick in the name of one of the guys who wrote an article, I just happen to know this, in the Tools of Change document. And of course, it's not going to show me what, it's, what I'm looking for. Why is it not going to show me that? Oh, because I only have it set to HTML documents. That's right. When you include more than one type of document, it asks you, you know, do you want to search only the HTML? Do you want to search HTML? All documents, you have these options. So if I say all documents, I can say film koi. And this time, it will actually return the article for 
Bill McCoy, and it will tell me how to navigate there. It doesn't actually take me there in the PDF file unless the PDF file has bookmarks that are set up to do that, I believe. Um, for the most part, I think I just said something incorrect. Um, when you open the PDF file, it does take you to the first page of the, of the PDF file, but it does tell you, at least in the table of contents or in your search results here, where things live in the PDF file. Um, you can see that I, I have an index here that came from various places, and everything that you see about what's being put into the index is all being controlled by the various areas um, that I've got set up in my com um, publishing configuration. So that is one thing here. Now, another thing that you can see here is I've shown you the PDF. You can see that here, I showed you before, we had the target searches, but it's only for the entire document or through the document headers. And here, we've actually got more options. Um, and those can be enabled through and behind the scenes um, in the field set.xml file that I mentioned earlier. Um, now, this is about as far as I want to take search uh, because the, it can go pretty far. Um, the search engine in Digital Media Publisher is based on um, the, or actually it is the Lucene open source search engine. And the nuts and bolts of that is for, for any search Obviously, you need an engine for indexing in the results. Uh, you need something to search, so whether it's full text or metadata or profiling, whatnot, um, and then you need to deal with the results. So, Digital Media Publisher for 5.4 uses Lucene, and the version of Lucene that's used as a full text index and search engine is 1.4.2, and there are two different parts of Lucene that are added in to parse HTML files and parse PDF files. And um, one is the NECO HTML um, edition, and the other one is something called PDF box, and that's what actually goes through. So the features of search include full text, field set, um, you can scope your searches, uh, previous versions, of Digital Media Publisher only supported defined field sets and searching of the content in those field sets and user configured scope search. So there's a lot more you can do in, in 5.4 than in previous versions. There is a search syntax that is supported. So um, if you have words that are separated by a space, such as epic space editor, that is considered to be the search of epic and editor. Um, you can search in multiple languages, and as I mentioned before, the stop words, those words that you don't want to be searched, are configurable. So, metadata goes into the indexable content through the include default metadata property in the dmp.properties file. Um, and you can, again, look in the documentation for where that's put together. But in the meantime, I'm going to take you through a couple of screens here that shows you in the DMP map exactly where you can set some of the things that go into your search. So in, in all things of enabling content and enabling semantic content, um, metadata is where it's at. It's, if you want to be able to find it, you've got to be able to label it, and uh, that's what metadata is all about. So Arbitex Styler which is our style sheet product, can pass metadata to each chunk in output. Um, it's also used to control how output is chunked, and by chunking, I mean what you see in the digital media consumer browser at any one time in the content screen. So you can have metadata either explicitly specified for the digital media publisher map, or you can generate it from the actual XML content for each chunk. Um, and the reference I'm going to give you here is there's a document composition and previews in the styler guide, um, pages 60 to 70 of the current Arbitrex styler documentation contain guided documentation for inserting attribute and element-based metadata 
uh, via either the dynamic insertion option or you can specify a value with the static option. And that's what these next things are going to be about. Um, so you see here, in this one, we have the area of where you set the locale. So there's the metadata for your language. And then down here, we have the area of where you would set the information that's all related to the update. So um, here's a couple of screens out of Styler that show where you can define custom metadata um, for purposes of time here. Um, I only showed the example of putting in some static metadata. Um, and it shows that I can put in a metadata value of, uh, of PTC that goes with the meta name company. And that will be passed through into the HTML head area of the content piece that I am publishing at that point in time. So there's a lot of options there. So the common data, metadata that can be also searched on um, file size, less modification, um, these things get extracted. And as I mentioned, um, include default metadata equals true into the dmp.properties file. Um, we'll extract additional information from HTML files, from PDF files, and Office documents. Um, for HTML files, the information that is extracted goes into um, meta. And for PDF and Office files, the actual file format document properties are what's extracted. How are we doing on time here? We have um, 15 minutes. OK. We have a lot of questions? Or? OK, well, we seem to be good right now. Um, just a word on profiling. Um, when you put profiles together, especially if you have, uh, say, map A has different profiles from map B, and you put them all together, you wind up with a, con a conglomerate of all the profiles to be able to choose from in the chunk level. Um, and, and again, that's also based on this would be the number of profiles that you could search, um, but each individual piece of chunk, uh, or each individual piece of content, I should say, is going to actually have the profile assigned to it. OK, so let's talk about dashboards. Tricking out the dashboard. Tricking out the dashboard, in, and this is where we're going to have some fun. Let me get out of here. OK, so you've seen this. You've seen the World Car Manual. You've seen the introduction to Arbortex that I don't know. OK, this is great. This is your basic the documentation um, interface where you can show written documentation so that people can read it on a screen instead of reading it on a piece of paper. And that's great, and it works really well. Uh, um, I have customers that are using uh, this type of presentation specifically to do things like um, uh, manufacturing instructions. Uh, so uh, we have a group um, that's got basically the people who are actually working with the soldering irons and the screwdrivers who are assembling things, putting things together, their assembly instructions are coming to them through the digital media consumer presentation. So uh, I want to show you something a little bit different, though, because there's a lot of different ways to think about information. And I, I did a blog post on this fairly earlier, earlier um, this week. And basically, what it, what it comes down to is information is only as good as what your users need and what they can use, which means you've got to be able to put it in front of them in a meaningful way that will make it useful for what they actually need to do. Now, we're talking about tricked out dashboards here. Um, this is a demo that has been put together with Digital Media Publisher, and it's, it's kind of to show the bigger picture of what things that can be done. But as you can see, um, in this particular example, things are very, very different. Yeah, I can still go through you know, my table of context if I want to here, or I can go back over and I can get at things a different way. The other thing you'll notice here is that I actually had to log into this environment. So there's nothing to say that you can't add things to digital media publisher that make it more toward the configuration you're looking for. So 
if I go into all wheel drive loaders here, and you can see that, you know, first I press a button, it gets me here, and now I can choose the model that I'm looking at. If I want to go and look at the accessories for that particular model, I can look at them in a flat kind of stat static way, or I can actually include something um, like a catalog, an actual catalog that people can page through. Um, and this is just, you know, a little bit of a flash plugin, um, but it actually makes a real difference um, for how people will look and use the information that you put in front of them. Um, so there's that. And then the other thing that you can do along the way is you can actually do things like embed product view um, so that people can actually get a bigger idea of what you know parts are in their product. This is being a little bit slow, um, part of the latency, I think, of the webinar itself. Um, but you can see that with any of these particular areas, I can actually go click on the various options and the options will take me, you know, into various places. So if I want to go look at the parking brake, if I click here on parking brake, it's going to show me the parking brake. And then I can do things from there. I can move it up and down, I can move it around, I can, you know, turn it from side to side. Um, so, you know, the basic things that you can do in, in product view, you can do here. Um, if I wanted to, for instance, and I hope this works, um, look at the disassembly of the parking brake. I can certainly do that by going and it can show me where the various different parts are. So if I click on shaft, I believe, we'll see if the latency will take me up or not. Yep, there it goes. Um, it will show me an exploded view of what I've been looking at uh, so that I can go and see what the various parts are. Um, and then of course, obviously, I can look at various other parts of the parking brake as well. I can look at insulation. Um, so it's just a matter of how you want to find things. And so you've seen that is a very different view. Um, and one of the things I'll point out here is here is the update button. If I had had an update enabled for this and I had clicked on that, it's going to come back and tell me that the update doesn't exist. But if an update had existed, it actually would have gone out, read the update, and then told me the process that it was going through and then succeeded in updating. In the meantime, wow, the fan just went on on my computer. <sighs> Sounds like a vacuum cleaner. So that is the, the basic tour of tricking out your dashboard for Digital Media Publisher. And that is what I have for you today. And I can't believe I finished in time. <laughs> Ahead of time. Hey, I Thank have a question. Thank you very much. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, have, I have a question for you. Okay. Um, are there any future plans to support restricting access based on metadata or um, some other strategies? So, for example, a teacher-student data set where teachers mm -hmm. can see everything, students only that material appropriate for them. You can already do that with profiling. Hmm. So that's um, what you do is you'd set up a profile where you'd have instructor and student. Um, you would apply the profiles to the content, and then you would, uh, there's a couple of different ways you could do this. You publish one instance for the instructor or one instance for um, the student, or you could publish one big instance and then rely on navigation features and search um, to show you the right things um, given the profile that you're looking at at that time. Um, and that could be based on, again, LDAP permissions um, or, or based on um, just profile criteria that gets embedded as metadata into the image itself. Mm -hmm. So it will not show you, like if you're looking for the pro at the table of contents for instructor, mm -hmm. it's not going to show you any of the options that are student and vice versa. Okay. Any okay, other do questions? We, any, any more questions? Feel free to, um, just one comment, fabulous. <laughs> okay, there's a Thank comment you. for you. <laughs> I didn't do this. <laughs> they built it, I just play with it. <laughs> Actually, this, the, um, 
everything I've learned about digital media publisher, um, I, I have to say that I've been using Urbitext for a long time, obviously. Um, and I actually did projects with Web Wireless Composer back in the early 2000s. Um, you know, and I did a couple of different projects with them. And one of the things that I really like about digital media publishers is it's so much easier to configure than previous versions of Web Wireless Composer were. Mm -hmm. um, and you can do a lot more with it. Um, I mean, there's just in terms of the search and the indexing and the UI and, uh, you know, we didn't have that stuff back then. Um, and we do now, which means you can put an actual viable UI out in front of your users that's designed with usability in mind, uh -huh. um, which is just a really great thing. So I basically um, spent my summer from July until about now um, basically going through digital media publishers with a fine tooth comb. So you can pretty much call it how I spent my summer vacation. <laughs> So um, I have I have another comment, which is more of a a, a comment information sharing um, regarding search. Um, and a comment came in that you can actually push the search into PDF if you hack the result.xsl style sheet, and that had to do with what you were talking about earlier. Um, you don't have to hack it. Um, basically, it by default will do a full text uh, indexing on PDF files that are included in the image. Mm. So you I actually have to turn that off <laughs> if you don't want it. Okay. So another um, question. Hang on one second. Okay. Well, so if they wanted to clarify, because I think they said that's not what they meant, but okay, they have a chance to clarify. Why well, I'll ask you another question is um, okay. how well does this work with S one thousand D? Does this work? That with is S1000D? not a question that. I have the answer to. Um, you would have okay. to talk to somebody who's a lot more familiar with S1000D than I am. Okay. Um, the the Arbortext S1000D products are, are separate from the core Arbortext products. Um, and I, I, I have not had a lot of experience since returning to the company in 2008 um, actually working with the S1000D standard. Okay. But okay. I, I, I bet that um, if you really wanted to pursue that, you could uh, find your local Arbortext reseller or your Arbortext salesperson and ask them mm -hmm. if they could find that answer for you. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, then another question regarding PTC University. Are there DMP-specific training classes at PTCU? Unfortunately, nope. There aren't. Okay. Right now. <laughs> okay. Um, I, I, what I can say is that um, I, I have circulated uh, this presentation um, around internally at uh, PTC, and there has uh, been some interest expressed in the hey, you know, we need right. to do something at some point. Uh -huh. um, and so, you know, people have been looking at these slides and thinking, huh, I wonder what we can do with training. Okay, good. Um, I have a, another PTC person who would like to um, share some thoughts regarding the question of S1000D. And Bill, Bill Martin is with us. Bill, can you hear me? Thank you. Sure. Yeah, there I can he hear is. You. Can, you, can you hear me? Okay. <laughs> yes. Um, first of all, gee, awesome. Thank you very much for that uh, demo. Uh, I just want to uh, chime in on with the question about the S1000D, and that is to have that person direct the question uh, to the S1000D team, and the person, uh, the first person to contact would be Ian Bolton. That's B-O-U-L-T-O-N, um, who is who is the head of the deployment uh, S1000D team at BTC. And um, how that would work? I mean, uh, S1000D already had his, his own IEDM, which is not DMP, and it's based on the specification that's developed by the S1000D committee. But in order to do this, we are currently working with a couple customers who want the ability to go back and forth between S1000D data and other uh, reusable XML data that's held in the CMS, whether it be PDM, Link, or Windchill. And therefore, once it's in that format, could obviously be put out with DMP. So that's kind of on the horizon, but um, S1000D product has an IEDM already 
which is kind of equivalent to DMP and actually has some features that DMP doesn't, including the uh, ability to do process stepping where you go through and actually answer questions and based on what you answer, uh, takes you through another set of uh, steps and processes. Um, so it's, it's a little bit more um, interactive that way. It, it's not as uh, pretty as DMP. It doesn't look as good, but uh, it has specific reasons for uh, being created the way it is. Great. Thank Thanks, you. Thanks, Bill. No problem. And do you have, um, can you just read out what Ian's email address is? Sure. It's, um, <clears throat> excuse me, it's I-B-O-U-T-O-N, so for Ian Bolton, at ptc.com. Thank you very much. Okay, I'm afraid that's all the time we have for questions. I'm going to pass this over to Liz for some closing. Uh, closing. Do you need me to do anything? Oh, oh no. Nope. I, I nope. did it. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I'll go ahead and put Bill back on. She's all powerful. <laughs> All right. Well, thank you, Jean. I know you just opened the hood and didn't go too deep under it, but thanks for taking the time to share your expertise with us. You're welcome. I, you know, I appreciate the opportunity. Um, I'm really excited about this product, and um, I think people in the company <laughs> have known that I've been excited about it. But as a former customer and user of the product, I'm really excited about the, the usability possibilities going forward. So... This Absolutely. is a good opportunity to at least point out where stuff is under the hood. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. We love talking about all the things you can do with Arbortex, but that's because we've got a long history with XML creation and delivery, and particularly the Arbortex suite of products. Sure. Uh, really fast, before we go, I'd like to take the opportunity to remind everyone of all the resources available to the Arbortex community. Ours is large and very tight-knit, and over the years, as things have changed, particularly after acquisition, we found that a lot of people didn't know all the resources available to them as Arbortext users. I've got a chart here. It's from the list maintained by Single Sourcing. That's us. The URL for the page is at the bottom of your screen. This is as near a complete list as I've been managing to maintain. Um, most of these are available online, um, but not all of them are. Going sort of briefly across and down, there are mailing lists that have been around from 1997 or the early 2000s, both for Arbortext main products and for 3B2, the Arbortext Advanced Print Publisher. There's a code archive that is a repository of customization codes, snippets, or other useful bits. There's the PTC user group focused on Arbortext. It's entirely virtual. There's an advisory line for the times that you're stuck, need a quick answer, and can't wait for the mailing list to get back to you. There's lots of community voices. There's blogs showing up more and more recently. There's Jean's XML in the Wild. That's our presenter today. There's James Sulak's Words in Boxes and Doug Wade's Structured Authoring. Um, all of them include information about Arbortext uh, development and authoring tips. Uh, there's the user community at Arbortext at DidaXML.org. There's the single sourcing blog on Web and Kindle and the PubWrite podcast of Arbortext Community Voices. Uh, I don't think Jean's been a subject for one, but she's going to be one soon. Uh, there's other community places, social media places. There's groups on Facebook for both 3B2 and Arbortext. There's a lot of Arbortext people on Twitter. We're on LinkedIn, and there's an Arbortext lens on Swidu, all things Arbortext in one place. Uh, the last row, Planet PTC community pages and forums at PTC. These have more visibility than a lot of these other resources. And folks are starting to really monitor and answer questions there. Uh, the biggest exception here is Isodraw. There is no better place to get Isodraw information than there on the forums. Uh, PTC has also taken over the annual user event, at least here in the U.S., and they maintain all of the events worldwide. PTC user provides guidance and assistance with the programming continuing today. They also drive the user technical committees, and I encourage everyone to join and help guide product development and the direction of the Arbortext products at PTC. There are lots of pictures of Arbortext folks over the years on Flickr, and there's an Arbortext channel on YouTube. Again, if you want to see the full list and just be able to click the links on these, go to the URL at the bottom of the slide, and thanks to, to we are the ones who t maintain the, this resources and donate these our time for everyone. And when you're ready to don your shop code or perhaps just start getting your master mechanics degree, go ahead and send us some questions. Um, we're happy to help. And thanks for attending today, and keep your eyes open for the next webinar we've got coming up. Thank you, everyone. Thanks, Jean. Thank you, Janice. Thank you, everyone. You're welcome.
Goodbye, everyone. Bye.